In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we know so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21 verse 1. Matthew 21 1. Here we begin the temple discourse. This is the, the temple discourse goes through chapters 21 through 23. Then we move on to the Olivet discourse in chapters 24 and 25. Now the temple discourse comes out of the Palm Sunday incident which we studied yesterday. And we'll go over Matthew 21.1 which is a review of what we went over in Mark 11 and 12. Matthew 21.1 Now when they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphaga at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. We don't know which two, but he sent two of them uh, to uh, get this donkey saying to them, Go to the village ahead. Right away you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Unite them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, you are to say, if anyone says anything to you, you are to say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And this is 21.5. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, oriented to grace and seated on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 21.6 So the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they did exactly as the Lord instructed without embellishing. A lot of people like to embellish, but they didn't. They simply followed instructions. 21.7 They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. And one thing to note from this is this is a donkey, an untrained donkey, brand new. And uh, the fact that the Lord could sit on it without it bucking, donkeys are known to be very rebellious. And this is an untrained donkey. Uh, and and, And it was tamed immediately when the Lord sat on it. And that is an illustration of the fact that in the tri- tribulation at the second advent, everything's going to be tamed by the Lord. And so he just sits on the donkey and it's tamed immediately. And that's something phenomenal just uh, seeing that. Then in 21a, a great crowd spread their cloaks on the way. This was a homage to the king. They spread the cloaks out because they knew he was the king of Israel. However, these who just spread out their coats did not know that he was the Son of God and they were doing this, remember, uh, for one reason only. They wanted to be freed from the Romans. They could have cared less about their eternal life. And they did not have their eyes uh, looking toward the light of eternity but rather focused on the moment. And what they wanted, they wanted right then. And they were actually instructing the Lord, Save us now, Hosanna. Do it now. But it wasn't time for that. In fact, uh, Israel's not going to get anything they want at this point, and they're going to go under the fifth cycle. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the way. Those who were cutting branches, in fact, many of them had believed in Christ, understanding that he was the son of David and the son of God and would bring them salvation. Then in 21 verse 9, The crowds that went ahead of him and those following were shouting, Save now. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What these folks are doing here, they're trying to put the cross, they're trying to put the crown before the cross, and the cross must come first. But uh, what they want is to be saved from the Romans. They could care less about eternal salvation, and they're not thinking in the light of eternity, but rather thinking about the moment, unconcerned about eternal life, but they're very concerned about the Romans. And a lot of this had to do with their religion. They hated the Romans. The Jews hated the Romans. In fact, the Jews hated anyone that was non-Jewish because they were steeped in religion. Also, they didn't like paying the high taxes that the Romans imposed upon them. And they did not like the Roman custom of worshiping many gods 
and they did not like the eagle, which was their uh, standard. Uh, ours is the eagle too, by the way. But that they didn't like it because it was a symbol of worshiping an, an, an idol, another god. And they had uh, no like whatsoever for the Romans. Therefore, what they wanted was our Lord. What they did was they instructed the Lord immediately, Save now, Hosanna. Save now. In other words, deliver us from the Romans now. They were not thinking in terms of eternal security, and they already thought they were going to Abraham's bosom simply because of their religion. And they didn't even realize they needed a Savior. They thought that because they followed the law, because they did no work uh, on sunset on Friday, and did no work until sunset uh, Saturday, they thought that for that reason they're going to heaven because they're so good. And they're not. But they do recognize Him as the Son of David finally. But that, that's not enough. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And they don't care about that. They just want to be saved from the Romans. They want to be saved from the Romans right then and right there. And 21.10, As he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar, saying, Who is this? So all of that, you can imagine someone walking in with the king's welcome, and there's a lot of people there who uh, they knew who he was, but they were saying, who is this, because why is he causing such a stir? What's so special about this man? A lot of them were religious leaders wondering why there was such a hullabaloo. What's the deal with this man? We're the ones who run the synagogue and the temple. This man is a nobody, so it went into an uproar. And actually, the word uproar in the Greek refers to an earthquake. The word is used for earthquake, and it means that they were all shaken by this event. They were disturbed, especially the religious leaders, extraordinarily disturbed by our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ becomes the center of discussion. Uh, He's getting toward the end of his ministry. He's about to go to the cross. And at this point, he becomes the center of all discussion right there in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the head of all religious activity. So he goes straight to Jerusalem. And he's about to deal with the religious crowd. 21.11 And the crowds were saying incorrectly. You see, the religious people and all that were saying, Who is this man? And then the crowds were saying, they were saying this, but it's an incorrect statement. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. First of all, the crowd gives a wrong answer. Instead of saying, This is the Messiah, the Son of God, they say He's a prophet. And instead of saying He's from Bethlehem, they say He's from Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. And he did live in Nazareth, but he also lived in Egypt, and they don't say this man's from Egypt. So he was from Bethlehem, and the reason why they distinguish Nazareth from Bethlehem is because in the prophecies, Bethlehem would be where the Messiah would come from. So they've rejected that, and they don't believe that. So, But they have accepted, accepted him as a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. They are deliberately ignoring that He is the Son of David, the Messiah, and they are deliberately ignoring the fact that He has a spiritual kingdom. And they say, well, He's just another prophet, like Elijah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. He's just a prophet. And why did they say these things? They had to hear it from somewhere, and I'll tell you where they heard it from. They heard it from the temple. The temple was the source of all the evil religion in the land, and it was shrouding the gospel and uh, they would go to the temple and people would ask about Jesus and some of the people in the synagogues the uh, religious leaders would say well this Jesus he's a prophet and they wouldn't directly slamming to the people because a lot of them had seen all the miracles so they have to say well he does these miracles because he's a prophet and they would never come to accept him as the son of God that's because they're under severe religion and the temple is the source of it all and some points we need to take out of this is the fact that Jesus when he goes to Jerusalem he goes straight to the problem the temple he doesn't go to the temple because it's a holy place he's going to the temple because it's filled with apostasy and it's ruining the whole city of Jerusalem Because the worst enemy in the human race is religion. Point one. The worst enemy in the human race is religion. Religion comes from Satan himself. Religion is uh, man 
seeking the approval of God through man's own works. They try to work their way into heaven. They try to receive the approval of God by working their way into heaven. This is what separates Christianity from all religions. The Muslims try to work their way in some odd ways to get into heaven or to go see Allah or whatever they do. The Hindus do something different. The Jews follow a bunch of laws, a bunch of legalism. And uh, when Christians start acting like this, it means there's apostasy. And many Christians act as if they must work their way into heaven. And they don't. That's just another form of religion. Christianity is God seeking man through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's only one name under heaven by which man can be saved. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is the only thing that says that. Nothing else does. Everything else says work hard, be good. Christianity says Jesus Christ did all the work you believe in Him. Completely separate from all the other religions. And sometimes you might ask yourself the question, how do I know I'm right and, and everyone else is wrong? A lot of people go through that, especially when they're teenagers. There's so many religions out there. How could this one be right? And that's because you think of Christianity as a religion. And in that case, it's a good thought. How can it be right if they're working their way into heaven? It's no different than any other religion when you function that way. But when you come to understand that Christianity is the only thing that offers a solution by faith alone in Christ alone, and when you understand that Christianity says there's no name under heaven by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ, then you begin to understand that Christ did all the work. And we don't do anything except believe, which is non-meritorious. And even when we believe, it's God the Holy Spirit that makes that faith effective for salvation. And we do nothing uh, to make it effective. We can't. We start out in spiritual death. And once you understand that, it begins to click in your mind, hey, this is completely separated from all religion. Therefore, religion is a counterfeit. It is Satan's ace trump. So our Lord spends, now this is a point we need to take concerning the following passages. Our Lord spends the nights at Bethany. Bethany's on a mountain. Uh, Bethany would be kind of like today, Beverly Hills. That was where all the wealthy people lived. And our Lord would go up there and spend the night with Lazarus, and the, the wealthy one, the wealthy Lazarus, and he would leave uh, Jerusalem and go to Bethany. And he would leave Jerusalem and spend the night in Bethany because Bethany was separated from all the religion that was going on in Jerusalem and also because all the religious leaders down in Jerusalem wanted to kill our Lord. They were seeking to kill him. Not that our Lord was scared of him. He wasn't. He was just separating himself from the crowd. But during the daytime, he would go down there and teach. And uh, what we see next in the following verses is the cleansing of the temple. And uh, here's a point we need to understand before we get into the cleansing of the temple. You see, this temple needs cleansing because it's filled with apostasy. It was supposed to be a place where people could worship and pray, and it was supposed to be a symbol of grace, but instead it's become a great symbol of apostasy, legalism. A bunch of gimmicks, a bunch of people trying to sell things and just the way they do in a lot of churches today, trying to uh, make you uh, done you for something. Well, they did the same thing back then. And uh, the principle is the world must be removed from the church before the church can reach the world. And a lot of day there, today there are a lot of churches involved in the world, the cosmic system. They're involved in using gimmicks using things outside of what Scripture says. So the principle, the world must be removed from the church before the church can reach the world. If they're acting like everyone else in the world, you're not going to reach anybody. If somebody goes into an evangelistic meeting and and automatically they are asked to start giving money as unbelievers, that church is acting like the world, acting just like this uh, temple, the people in the temple. And so what our Lord does, He has to get tough with them and say, well, time to cleanse the temple. And not only the temple, His temple. The whole temple was designed, the whole concept of the temple was designed so that people could learn from foreshadowing about the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole concept of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, all of those things foretold of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was His temple and He's going to go cleanse it. 
And you'll be shocked how He's going to cleanse it. 21.12 Then Jesus entered the temple. Now in the King James it says temple of God, but of God is not found in the original language. Then Jesus entered the temple. Of God it's just simply not there. And uh, the reason why is because it's an evil place at this point. It was designed to be a temple of God, but at this time it had gone into apostasy, and of God is just not there. It's just a temple. Then Jesus entered the temple area and physically threw out all those who were selling and buying in the temple courts and turned over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. So he physically threw them out. This, and from the Greek, this means to throw them out with physical violence. I mean, he picked them up. I mean, he didn't, even, he didn't even drag them out. He threw them. This indicates that our Lord was not some skinny freak that you see in pictures. He was strong, extraordinarily strong. You have to be strong to pick up some of these people and throw them out of the temple and to turn over all the money which weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Just grabbed them by their cloak, picked them up, and threw them out, just like you see on the movies. Exactly how he did it. Like a Terminator or something else. A very powerful man. Very powerful. The Lord Jesus Christ was strong. Not weak. Not physically weak. Not until he was beat half to death. And even then he survived all that, which is uh, uh, phenomenal. So Jesus Christ was strong. Very strong. And by the way, in the temple, there were soldiers there guarding the money, helping out the priests, guarding the priests, because there was a big conglomerate there, almost like a mafia-type setup, and everybody was skimming profits off everybody else, and so they rubbed each other's backs, and so there were Roman soldiers there. But notice, the Roman soldiers don't even bother with the Lord while He's throwing people out of the temple. They're probably scared. They probably see all that force and say, I ain't messing with him, you do it. Just throwing them right out. Powerful. But we must understand something else concerning this. Before our Lord even begins to teach doctrine in the temple, He's got to start throwing out all the evil that's going on. And this happens a lot of times. Uh, Well, I remember one time the story of a man who was, uh, he was preaching. And he had been preaching for about 10 years and his congregation had swelled to about 500 or more. And then uh, suddenly someone introduced him to my pastor's tapes. And he started listening to the tapes. Then he wrote a letter to my pastor with something like this. He said, I've listened to some of your tapes. He said, I've been a pastor for 10 years. I got some of your tapes. I listened to your tapes and then I got saved. And he was preaching, wasn't even saved. And then he said, uh, I kept on listening and I started to teach some of the things that you've been teaching me. And now I have a congregation of 30. Well, he started out in the world. And he started out as an unbeliever and I'm sure he gave some very beautiful messages not related to Christianity or anything else, just probably something uplifting. And then suddenly, when he learned everything that he needed to know, I'm sure he didn't grow up that much, but he just started teaching stuff like rebound and uh, things of grace, and people didn't like that. So obviously he got dogmatic with them. Well, our Lord, in order to cleanse out the temple, he not only get he doesn't just get dogmatic, he gets physical. He gets physical. He doesn't even bother saying get the hell out. He physically gets them the hell out on his own powerful man and he's cleansing out the temple from all this religious garbage that's the picture of it all and also the principle is uh, churches should not be going around seeking money and the, the temple was not designed for them to have money changers and to be making money in that way an absorbent amount of money but what they would do see in the temple the people would go and make sacrifices and if somebody came from Bethphage and had bought a, uh, a, an animal for sacrifice for $5 and they went into the temple, the priest would say, Hey, where'd you get that? And they would say, Up in Bethphage. And they'd say, Uh-uh, you must have a holy lamb from the temple. And you must buy it right here from the temple. And they would mark it up some ten times. So then they'd have to pay 50 bucks for one of the temple uh, animals. And they would get gouged. And then the doves, see, uh, were for poor people. 
they would sell the doves to the poor. But you can tell they didn't even care about the poor. They're going to mark up the doves as well. It wasn't like Walmart where all the prices are falling and it went sky high. And that was the only way they would allow you to worship. And it was a type of mafia ring that they had set up in which the temple could take in an, an absorbent amount of money. In the same way churches around here always begging for money are doing the same thing. Church is supposed to be a place for doctrine, but when they pull in all this idea about money, this and money, that, there is a place for giving, and there's a book over there on giving that's very good, and it all deals with grace, and uh, people should be motivated on their own to give, but it's not. you don't have pastors getting up and dunning people and calling people on the phone and saying, we need a bigger gym, let's, uh, let's uh, hustle around and give me money, 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 all about money. Well, our Lord would have done the same thing in these churches, just start uh, tipping over things. And uh, that was, of course, under the authority of the Lord. The Lord could do it because it was His house. We can't go around, we can't walk into a Baptist church and start uh, tipping over all their things. It's none of our business. It's not our house. But this is the Lord's house. He has every right to do this. And He's not overstepping His authority. And uh, frankly, I've never heard a Baptist minister ever make any uh, reference to the fact that these people are uh, begging for money and all of that, and I do the same thing. Oops, of course not. They're not going to call themselves out. And so they'll just probably gloss over it and just read it and keep going. But there's always an application. And what should the temple should have been functioning. People buy their own animals on their own and then uh, take it to the altar on their own. And if it doesn't have a spot or blemish, they should have allowed it. They were money hungry. What we notice about this from Matthew is Matthew doesn't say much about it, but John, uh, the, the Apostle John, has a lot to say about it in his synoptics. But uh, Matthew, remember, was a tax collector, and uh, that kind of dealt with his past. He was used to uh, skimming off the top. He was used to, and the tax collectors were in a type of mafia system too. And the Romans didn't care if uh, the tax collectors would skim off the top because they knew they would be eager to collect taxes if they were getting a little portion of it. So they just uh, winked at it. Yeah, they're taking off the top, but that's how they got more money too. So they just winked at it like a mafia organization would. Matthew was involved in all that, and he got out of it, of course. So that's probably one of the reasons why he doesn't have much to say about it. So Jesus Christ went into the temple because apostasy removed the potential of the temple being of God. Nope, the of God's not there. And that potential was removed because of all the apostasy in the temple. And the temple reflected everything that was going on in Jerusalem. That was the one place of worship where all the Jews went. And it was completely apostate. The temple was in the heart of the city. That would be Herod's temple. And if, uh, if, the, if, there were, if there were things wrong with the temple, there's going to be things wrong with the people because that was their religion and that's where they went. So Jesus goes directly to the temple to cleanse it, to make a point. So the issue must be clarified in the temple before it can be clarified in the city. He had to make it clear and that was one way of doing it. Notice he hasn't said one word yet. He's just been very physically... Uh, well, he, he's just been throwing people out. And people would look at him and say, that dude's crazy. He's a madman. And I'm sure a lot of them did. Well, he's nuts. And they didn't say it to his face after seeing all that strength. Although later they would get enough uh, uh, pride so that they'll try to uh, arrest him. And they will. So it is religion... That leads to rejection of Christ. The hardest people to witness to outside of child abusers are religious people. And they just have a hard time coming to believe in Christ because their whole life they believed in themselves and their good works. And they're going to heaven because they've been good. And if you run into somebody who says, I'm good, so I'm going to heaven, it's very hard to witness to them. So there's a great deal of religion in Israel, in Jerusalem especially, and the headquarters of all this religion is in the temple, our Lord's house. So he had to clean it up. Then in 21.13, And he said to them, It stands written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are turning it into a den of robbers. Now, the King James might say a den of thieves, but uh, 
you, you, you do know the difference between a thief and a robber. A thief is a person who sneaks up on you. A thief tonight, if there were thieves around here, they would sneak around out here and just uh, while everybody's in church and they would uh, make sure that everybody was in church and then go around, steal something and walk off. That's a thief. A robber would bust through the door and show the gun and say, give me your money. They do it by force. A thief sneaks. A robber does it by force. And that's the difference. And he's saying, you're a den of robbers. In other words, you're taking money by force. And he calls it his house, my house, because everything in the temple dealt with Christ. Everything in the temple spoke of the work and the person of Jesus Christ. Yet they did not understand that. And Jews today don't understand their heritage and the fact that it all deals with Christ. And some of you may know some Jews who don't... Most Jews today don't even recognize their own heritage or even realize what it's all about. Most of them don't eat, aren't even kosher. Most of them eat ham and bacon and they just don't follow the old rules that were there. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that they were went under the fifth cycle and all of that was wiped out. And uh, you were to talk, if you were to talk to a Jew today about the temple worship and say and talk about the sacrificing of the lamb... They wouldn't know what you were talking about. Of course, they do. Uh, usually, they know the Passover, but they don't know what it's about. And they'll follow that, and they may go to synagogue once a year, and that's about it. And they know nothing about their heritage. So if you go up to a Jew and say, well, he's a Jew, I'm going to come at him from the angle of the Old Testament. Don't bother. Simply give him the gospel. The power of God for salvation is found in the gospel. And whether it's the gospel from Isaiah or the gospel from Romans or the gospel from Acts, that will work with them. They're human beings. It will work with them if they're positive, just as it would work with anyone else. So if you run into a Jew, just give them the gospel straight. That's what they need because most of them, unless they're rabbis, have no clue about their heritage. A lot of them think of themselves as being Jews simply because of Judaism, and they don't even know that they're a race. I've known Jews not even know. They call themselves Jews because they're Judaizers and their parents were. They don't even have a clue they're a race. It's really strange, but that's part of the veil that's covering their faces. And it must be ripped in two by the gospel. And by the way, the veil over the temple is about to be ripped in two as well. So 21.14, The blind and lame came to him in the temple courts, and he healed them. The purpose of healing, again, is so that everyone could see the unique person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was His badge. That's the way He could say, look, I'm the Messiah. I can uh, heal people. No one else could around there. Only He could. And it was a way for Him to say, I'm the Messiah. I'm here. I have arrived. Prophecy has said so. Therefore, I'm here. 21.15 But when the chief priest and the experts in the law saw the wonderful things He did, and heard the children singing out in the temple courts. That really got to them to see these uh, children singing out in the temple courts. Hosanna to the Son of David. They became indignant. They saw the wonderful things. They saw the miracles. They saw the little children singing Hosanna to the Son of David. They had seen these miracles, yet they didn't believe in Christ. You would think that these people would be one of the first ones to believe in Christ. But they didn't. Miracles didn't save them. And miracles saves no one. It has to do with faith alone in Christ alone. And people say, if I just saw a miracle, I would believe. No, they wouldn't. They would be just like these hard-headed religious people who see a miracle and say it must be from the devil. And they would probably go along with that instead. But the children here, this is interesting, the children are the ones singing out in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, when the adults did it, they were doing it because they wanted to force the kingdom. Children knew nothing about the coming kingdom. The only reason the children were singing Hosanna to the son of David is because these children had believed in Christ and they had seen their parents or someone else doing this. So this was their way of praising the Lord. They couldn't have enough doctrine to do it any other way, so they just copy what the other people are doing to show some type of respect for the Lord because they'd already believed in Him. So they're not held to account for their ignorance. They're just children. 
And so what, what occurs here, as the, 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 the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees become very offended, actually what, they become very jealous because they're in competition with the Lord. And none of the children had ever stood up in the temple courts and sang about them, and that really rubbed them the wrong way. So, and they probably knew a lot of these children. Say, I want them to. They never sang about me, and they just got mad, jealous, envious. So they said to him, "Do you hear what they are singing? Big deal. Yeah, of course. Uh, as if our Lord's deaf." Jesus said to them, "Yes, of course he does. Yes." Then he hits them again with this. Uh, this is the actual translation, and this rubs them the wrong way even more. Yes. Have you never studied? And they study all the time. This is what infuriates them all the more. Have you never studied? Out of the mouths of children and nursing infants, you have perfect praise. So he goes back and pulls out at a thousand years old the prophecy and says this is the way it was going to be. Have you not studied the fact that this is what was going to happen. So the children were believers, and when they, were, when they sang this, it was a demonstration of their faith. They had already believed, but they, they wanted to demonstrate it somehow. And usually when children learn something, they get excited about it, especially the younger children, five and six and seven. They get very excited, and they want to share it with everybody. If they first learn their ABCs, they want to tell everybody the ABCs. Look what I can do. Oh, I can tie my shoe. Watch. Then they make you watch it and do it over and over and over again, and that's good, dear, and etc. And but with the the same with these children, they had received the fact that uh, the, that he was the son of God. They had believed it, and they were excited about it. So they're just uh, singing along what everyone else was doing, but they did it out of respect and out of faith not to intimidate the Lord, but it was the type of respect from them. Then in 2117, after the uh, Pharisees made a big deal out of it because they were jealous, and leaving them, he just left them. He was probably pretty disgusted. He didn't like dealing with the religious crowd anyway. He had just spent half the day throwing them out of the temple, and now he had to deal with them nitpicking again. So he just leaves, sick of it. And he's not going to listen to it anymore. So leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany. Remember, I told you he would go in the daytime into Jerusalem. At night, go back to Bethany where the atmosphere was friendlier. Then in the daytime, go back to the temple. He still had a job to do and he was, he was uh, busy ripping these people apart. So he went out of Bethany because the religious leaders there wanted to kill him. And he, or he went, he went out of Jerusalem because they wanted to uh, kill him. Then he spent the night there in Bethany with Lazarus. And now we move on to the unproductive fig tree, 2118. Now early in the morning as he returned to the city, he's going back to Jerusalem now. Early in the morning as he returned to the city of Jerusalem, he was hungry. It was time for breakfast. Our Lord was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, and there were a lot of fig trees uh, in between the top of the mountain and the bottom. So he went to the fig tree, but found nothing on it except leaves. The leaves of the fig tree indicate that it's uh, ripe for harvest. It's time to uh, pick the figs. It's time to have breakfast. But this one had leaves, but no fruit. The fig, the fig leaves actually represent, in this case, it represents the Jews. The Jews here happen to be the fig tree. The leaves, in, the leaves indicate the Jews say that they are productive. They say, we're a productive tree. Look at my leaves. But they don't produce fruit. What this means is they're proud of their religion. They're proud of their human good production. They're proud of what they do under the Mosaic law. But it's nothing but a bunch of leaves. No fruit. No good of intrinsic value. He said to it, Never again will there be fruit from you. This is the fifth cycle of discipline. He's talking about Israel. And the fig tree withered immediately. So it had leaves. 
The fact that it had leaves means that it was ripe for picking. It should have had fruit, but it didn't. And sometimes after you have a fruit tree for long enough, it all of a sudden just stops bearing fruit. It still has leaves. Well, our Lord, uh, even though He's hungry, He's always ready to make a doctrinal point, and He's making one to the disciples. And He says, um, this fig tree has leaves, and then he, uh, but uh, no fruit. So then He uh, says something to the tree that the disciples can't hear, and the fig tree withered immediately. Now the disciples, being as dumb as they were at this point, uh, probably said, he's mad at that tree. <laughs> they probably did. They probably said, he's so hungry, that tree just pissed him off. And he <laughs> withered it up. He wanted some fruit. But he was trying to make a, a spiritual principle here. The leaves are the Israelites. The fact that it shriveled up means the fifth cycle of discipline. And how do I know that the fig leaf represents working for salvation. You might be skeptical on that. Where in the world did you get a fig leaf representing working for salvation? Do you remember the first work ever in human history? Adam and Eve. What did they do? They put fig leaves around their private parts so that they could adjust to each other and think they were adjusted to God. They thought that would impress God. So the fig leaf represents working for salvation. All the Jews were putting on fig leaves, working for salvation. And this has been the way it was since the Garden of Eden. Now later on, of course, Adam and Eve did believe and then clothed themselves with a sheepskin, representing they were clothed with Christ. So they did believe, and they're in heaven today. It took them some 900 and odd years to get there. It's a long time to live. So when the disciples saw it, they were amazed. They're always amazed at the miracles. They'd, hear, they'd heard the gospel so much, they're, part, they're probably about ready to puke when they hear it, but they shouldn't be. They should be more amazed with the power of doctrine than with the power of him shriveling up a tree. But it's human nature, especially when you are spiritually immature, to be impressed with miracles, so they were. So when the disciples saw it, they were amazed, saying, How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth, if, this is a third class condition, meaning maybe you will, maybe you won't, if you have faith, that is faith rest, and do not receive doubt, and do not receive doubt, and it's important to be translated as do not receive doubt because it's in the passive voice. It's passive. It's something that you receive. If you have the faith rest, you can uh, receive doubt. How do you receive doubt? Well, if some of you go to college, you're going to receive a lot of doubts from your professors. They'll teach to you about Darwin and atheism, and they'll teach to you about all types of things that are antithetical to Christianity. And for some people, if they don't have any doctrine, they'll start receiving doubts. And they'll get into some study of psychology and say, well, my psychologist says it's environment. That's the reason why people turn out bad, and they have evidence. And the professor showed me this to me, and since they have a degree, it must be right. So you receive doubts concerning the Christianity or the doctrine you started with. And you receive it. But if you grow in grace and in knowledge, you get to a point of uh, spiritual autonomy, and that means you're, you're autonomous to this doubt. And no matter what the professor says, you don't believe it, and you don't receive the doubt of it. That's why it's in the passive voice. And a lot of people have high regard for people who doubt all the time. Or people who say, it could mean this or it could mean that. That's the way these scribes and Pharisees taught the Bible. That's the way a lot of churches, that's the way a lot of pastors today teach the Bible. Well, it says this, what do you think it means, Johnny? Well, that sounds good, Johnny. What do you think it means, sister so-and-so? And they all go around and give their, this is in Sunday school usually, and they all go around and give their own opinion on the Bible. Well, there has to be an authority on it. What does it mean? It can't mean two things. It means one thing. It can't mean several different things. There might be several different applications, but it's got to be a right one, and you can't do it that way. It's not the way. And, and a lot of people develop a higher regard. Well, that man's so humble. He doesn't really know, but he's got some good ideas on it. He's humble. If somebody's sure of themselves, usually they're uh, labeled as arrogant. Well, you're too sure of yourself. How do you know all that? Well, spiritual autonomy. That's how. Because you're filled with the Spirit and been learning doctrine. That's how. And that's the way you should be. 
But uh, most people who are dog dogmatic aren't usually liked. But our country was founded on the fact that there were a lot of dogmatic people. And if you really knew what the uh, Declaration of Independence was saying, it was actually being very dogmatic to a king in England. Very dogmatic. So our country was founded by dogmatic people. And it's, that's not a disease. It's a vocabulary word. It means they're forceful. It means they're, uh, they, um, they understand the principle and they're dogmatic with it. And today, uh, especially in the media, they don't like dogmatism. And oftentimes, the, the famous evangelist who goes on television has to be very careful with what he says in order that he doesn't offend anyone. I saw Franklin Graham on the Fox News channel. What he said was, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't, except the invite Christ into your heart part. He threw that in there, and that's disgusting. But in the end, he said, believe in Christ. So I, at least he said that much, so somebody might catch on to that and believe. Uh, but... Uh, you could tell he was phrasing what he had to say very carefully. And the interviewer was trying to prod him to say, look, are all these disasters the result of the way America's been going lately? And instead of saying, well, hell yes it is, he had to be very careful with what he said. And so, uh, dogmatism is usually not liked, and, but uh, uh, notice what our Lord is. He's not running into the temple turning the other cheek, is he? He's not being political. He's throwing people out the temple. And it, and it had a large stairway, and they probably just tumbled right down it. Just threw them out, one after another, throwing over money changers. The media had been there. They would have made fun of him on the nightly news. To say, and they probably made a commercial out of him. Uh, look, he's wearing Nike shoes. Look what they can make you do. And they would make fun of him and, and interpret him as uh, being some type of nut. And I always remember that uh, one commercial where the, it, they're in the middle of a football game or soccer game or something and some man runs across the field naked and the only thing he's wearing is Nikes. And that was the commercial. I don't know if that's real or not, but it was, it's a funny commercial. But that's how they, they would have made fun of the Lord in the same way. And so our Lord was dogmatic. And then in 21:22, And whatever you ask in prayer, believing through faith rest, you will receive. Well, I miss 21, 21. Relax, I'll go back. Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth. If, maybe you will, maybe you won't, have faith rest and do not receive doubt, not only will you do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be moved and thrown into the sea, it will happen. you got to understand what he's saying. He says, but even if you say to this mountain, not any mountain, this mountain, do you remember what mountain he's on or near? The Mount of Olives. What's going to happen in the tribulation at the end of the second advent? It's going to be split in two and a big sea is going to flood in. And do you know today in Asheville there was an earthquake? In the high, some hot springs, North Carolina, it was felt down in Asheville, Tennessee, and Georgia. A 3.8 earthquake. I didn't feel it, but I'd be sleeping at 4 a.m. anyway. I don't know if it came down this far. I doubt it, but that's just weird. I didn't even know there was a fault line in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, well. So um, that's what's gonna, what made me remember that is because uh, in the tribulation at the end of it, Jesus Christ is going to come down and there's going to be a big earthquake and the mountain is going to move. It's going to be split in two and move and in will come a sea. And what he's doing is saying there's going to be people in the future waiting for my return in the tribulation, and they're going to be, and they know the doctrine, and so what they're going to say is uh, they're going to be anticipating the coming of the Lord, and they're going to look at the mountain and say, Move! And then the Lord's going to come back, and boom, the mountain's going to move. It's referring to that specific incident. We could go up here to North Carolina to Mount Mitchell and have the faith and keep saying, Move, mountain, move, mountain, and it's going to stay right there. I mean, you can't, it's, you can't literally do it, but the principle is the faith rest drill can get you through any circumstance. That is the principle. Because in the tribulation, they're going to be under the most terrible of circumstances. And they're going to be bullets flying over their head, and bombs everywhere, and blood's going to be blowing through the street. And they're going to have the faith rest to walk forward and look at the Mount of Olives and say, Move! Move it! 
and boom, it's going to split in two because our Lord's going to do it. And it's going to be a rather remarkable thing, but they believe it and it happens. So our Lord print, uh, teaches them a principle that the faith rest drill can be very powerful in your life. And if a faith can move mountains, that is through the faith rest drill, then uh, you shouldn't have any problems in your life either. No matter what mountain you're trying to climb, if you have the faith rest drill, there should really be no problems in your life as you see it. Then in 21:22, and whatever you ask in prayer, believing, that is through the faith rest drill, you will receive. And whatever you ask in prayer, believing through the faith rest drill, you will receive. Now, there's a, some of my. I have a, a grandmother-in-law, and she is known. She went to Bracket Church for years. She is known as the prayer warrior of the family. And uh, and I was thinking today. I was watching this hurricane heading toward Houston. Now maybe a little east of Houston. But uh, they live. Grandmother-in-law. Is there such thing? She's in law, but it's not my other grandmother. Of course, she's not a... Pr well, never mind. But uh, my grandmother-in-law is a prayer warrior. My grandmother's a nice lady. My grandmother-in-law, though, is a prayer warrior. And uh, I was watching this hurricane heading toward Houston, and she lives north-northeast of Houston, what, 50 miles? And I was looking at that track, and I said, man, it looks like it's going to walk right over San Jacinto County and uh, level that place. But then I thought about uh, the little grandmother-in-law. And I know she's probably praying right now that that thing will uh, turn away or just fizzle out. And uh, we'll see what happens. But she's known to be a phenomenal prayer warrior. And uh, she believes it when she prays. And so many wonderful things happen when she uh, goes into prayer. And so, but, and that's because it's coupled with the faith rest drill. She understands the faith rest drill as well. And so, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. And then, of course, my mother-in-law and father-in-law are there as well, and I don't think uh, I don't think they know what's about to come. I, they just don't even. I don't think they know what. A, I don't know what a hundred mile an hour winds are like. But uh, I, I would have got the heck out of there. I at least got to where I knew I could have some power in a little while. They may be without power for a long time if it hits them. I just uh, I think it's crazy. They should have came up here and came to church. That's what I think. But. <laughs> So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.